Good morning. We're going to talk about color today. You notice I look the same because I'm recording this right after your packaging lecture. But, and we've talked about color already a little bit because we talked about it with port quality. A lot of you are designing studies where you're measuring color and it became very apparent, I think, to everybody that color is a very important part of shelf life and of consumer acceptability. Consumers purchase first with their eyes. And so uh, color, uh, I've given you the color guidelines that are in the folder on eCampus. Those are the current color guidelines. They're about ready to come out a little bit differently, but they have a lot of information there. The objective of this lecture is to understand color pigments of meat and factors that affect their chemical state, and then also understand how to measure color subjectively and objectively. Now we've already talked about this, so I'm just gonna expand on this a little bit, uh, especially to do the subjective evaluation uh, to make sure that you understand how you would do that if you were developing color standards. And then finally to understand factors that affect color in meat. I think I answer probably about a third of the questions I answer for industry are related to color. So color is very important. And uh, color really, when you're going through this lecture, you think it's really not that complicated, but it's a lot more complicated than you think. The pure definition of color are, is hue, chroma, and value. And hue measures the basic colors of red, blue, green, and yellow. And it's actually a measurement of the wavelength, because remember, light is a wavelength. And so we have shorter or longer wavelengths, and usually uh, uh, measured in nanometers. Chroma is the purity or saturation of for color, and that measures the intensity. How many wavelengths you have there? How strong is the color? And then value is the overall light reflectance, which is a measure of brightness. In meat, uh, we have color because there are pigments, which are proteins in the meat that either abs that absorb certain wavelengths of light and they reflect other wavelengths. The, uh, the major protein in meat that gives it its color, about 80 to 90% of the total pigment is myoglobin. And myoglobin can exist in three states. It can exist in other states, uh, additional states, but those are very specific to usually uh, issues with uh, contamination. Hemoglobin is also gonna be present in meat. Hemoglobin and myoglobin were some of the first proteins that were really characterized in biochemistry. When I took biochemistry many years ago, we actually started out in the protein chemistry part of biochemistry talking about hemoglobin and myoglobin because they were very well understood. Uh, we know that hemoglobin is in blood. During exsanguination, we're going to try to remove most of the, the blood in the animal, but during that process, we have some remaining hemoglobin in the capillaries and, and in the blood system that's left there that we don't drain all out. But there are also other compounds, catalases, uh, mainly uh, flavins uh, are in the sarcoplasm of meat, and they also have some uh, ability to absorb and reflect light. And there are other colored substances, cytochromes in the mitochondria in that cytochrome chain. They also have the ability uh, to uh, absorb or reflect light. But notice most of the, the pigment is from myoglobin. So we're gonna talk first about myoglobin and then we'll kind of touch on a couple of these other ones uh, as we go through this. So this is myoglobin. Myoglobin is a globular protein. Uh, it has a globular portion and a heme ring. Now, this is the picture from your textbook. There's the globular protein. Uh, this is the heme ring. And there's, that means that there's iron. Remember, iron has uh, six binding sites. So you see it's in a, in, in a ring here with nitrogen bound. And then it has a ligand down here that has the ability to bind different uh, ion 
compounds or are different compounds. And then here is the globulin ring. And during a student's prelim, we realized as meat scientists, that's what we use for what myoglobin really looks like. But you know what? Myoglobin really looks like this, and this, and this. So this is myoglobin, and F and E and H and A, B and A are, are different uh, structures within, uh, they're actually helical structures, the alpha helixes. I'm not gonna give you a protein chemistry lecture, but those are one of the structures of a protein. But here's the heme ring, and uh, there's iron, and look at here. This is the globulin. It isn't just a little tiny globulin up there. It surrounds this, and there's actually a channel. And this is the heme ring. This is old. This is a different view of it, but uh, this is another way of looking at it. There's actually the globulin kind of forms a U. It's harder to see here, but you can kind of see it here around the heme ring. And there is this channel. And depending on the state, that channel may be open or closed. And the ligand that we talk about is sticking out here in the bottom of that heme. And depending on whether the channel is open or closed, affects what compounds can come in contact with that ligand. And things don't really bind to the ligand, they're just attracted to the ligand. That was the other thing. You know, this is the what I would draw when I was doing my prelims and what I initially taught and thought about. But this ligand here, uh, it doesn't really bind uh, water, H2O here, but water is what's kind of capping over it and coming in close proximity. So I just want to make that apparent to you. I don't want you to think about that this is a compound with this big heme ring and yeah we talked about the globulin and everything but you need to understand that that from a three-dimensional standpoint uh, this is a medium-sized protein really not that big. Its main role is to grab oxygen from hemoglobin in the blood system in the capillaries and store oxygen on that heme ring. And if, on that ligand. And if the oxygen is not there, then there are other compounds that will be there. Water, CO2, CO, we talked about CO, carbon monoxide, those type of things. So we're, well, let's, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is uh, another picture to show you the heme ring, the globulin around it, but these, notice all of it has these alpha helical structures. Uh, that are, it's a globular protein. One thing we know about globular proteins is that on the outside of the globular protein is going to be the hydrophilic region, that region which will bind with water. And myoglobin is water soluble, so it's in the sarcoplasm, it's floating around, and water is attracted to it. And the more uh, hydrophobic region is going to be in the center. So this is just another picture of this. You can see um, here is the ligand with, uh, with uh, carbon monoxide bound to it. And I just wanted to, again, make sure I emphasize that. So there are the factors that affect color. One of the first factors I want to talk about is how much myoglobin is present in a meat. So we know that species, uh, that meat from different species looks different. Whale meat is very dark red. Horse meat the little, is pretty dark red. Beef is bright cherry red. Lamb is, uh, is pinkish red. And pork is grayish red, grayish pink. And fish, we have white fish and we have darker fish. So species affect how much flavor is there. Uh, the age of the animal affects how much myoglobin would be present. And here I have meat from young animals, medium and old animals, and you see that they're darker red as the animal gets older. 
this, uh, the meat from this animal has a higher myoglobin content. Sex. Bulls have darker meat than heifers and steers because they need more oxygen and in their muscle, they need to store more oxygen. Because remember, they're ready to fight. They're ready to go out there and, and be the strong bull. Muscles also differ in amount of myoglobin. Um, what we find is that different muscles have different colors. I always think about the top round versus the bottom round. And uh, the reason for that is because the bottom round and the inside round, the semimembranosus, those are locomotion muscles. They need more oxygen. They have more myoglobin. Versus uh, the LD. Top butts also, because they're right here at the top of the hip, they're used to move the legs. And we can change the amount of myoglobin in a muscle by physical activity. If you are doing, uh, if you decide that you want to be a marathon runner and you're going to move towards that, you will uh, slowly increase the amount of myoglobin that's in the muscle. So let's look at the species effect. Uh, these are the descriptors of meat from different species. So horses, dark red, beef, bright cherry red, veal, which is beef from young animals, is brownish pink. Uh, lamb, light red to brick red, pork, grayish pink, poultry, gray white to dull red, and fish, gray white to dark red. And I just put some pictures of, uh, these are chicken breasts, here's some pork, and there's some beef. And those differences in color are very apparent, and it is directly related to the amount of myoglobin that's present. And those values are in the literature. Uh, if you're ever interested in them, I think that they have those in your textbook. But uh, this is from a book chapter that I did a few years ago where I went through and looked at uh, myoglobin content in milligrams per gram in muscle. And see beef, this is young beef. This would be veal. This would be three-year-old beef, 4.6. Lamb, 2.5, about half the amount. Dark poultry meat from, male, uh, from females, notice less than lamb. Dark spe species fi uh, fish, look, some of them have really high myoglobin, but some of them are about, uh, about what beef is. And in Turkey, when we'll see that uh, 24 week old females uh, for dark meat have about one milligram per gram. So, and it isn't as dark as beef, but it's still darker than poultry or turkey white meat, which would be 0.25. So you can see that uh, across species, five month old pork, 0.3, it has the grayish pink color. Poultry white meat, much less, and white meat fish species, much less. So you can see that species affects it. You can also within these see how age affects myoglobin content. Here's beef right here. Uh, and as animals get older, myoglobin increases. You can also see that with poultry. I put poultry dark meat. Notice that the younger animals have less myoglobin. And that's true for turkey dark meat and turkey white meat and poultry white meat. The younger animals always have less myoglobin. We can also see the sex effect on this slide, where males have higher myoglobin than comparable age of females within a species. So here I have females and males that are poultry dark meat. Notice the males have higher myoglobin content. Same thing for turkey dark meat, male, female. They're the same, but once they hit puberty, and they're starting, the males are starting to have second have testosterone production and secondary sex characteristics, myoglobin goes up. And we can see that um, in a poultry white meat, not as big of an effect. In turkey uh, white meat, we see it's there, but because there isn't as, as much myoglobin to begin with, uh, the effect isn't as pronounced as we see in dark meat. So, those things affect how much myoglobin is there. We expect that, we know that. Then the next point is how much myoglobin is there, but then what is the state of the myoglobin? And there are three potential states of myoglobin. 
There's deoxymyoglobin, oxymyoglobin, and metmyoglobin. And I have provided pictures here so you can see it. This is metmyoglobin, brown. This is oxymyoglobin, bright cherry red. Those are from the same animal. And this is vacuum packaged meat, which would be deoxymyoglobin, that's purple. So this, those are different states of myoglobin with approximately the same amount of myoglobin. And so this is from Lowry's Meat Science, eighth edition. And uh, this shows, here is deoxymyoglobin, oxymyoglobin, and metmyoglobin that I just introduced to you. And I think most of you probably already know this, but in um, unoxygenated meat, deoxymyoglobin is the, the normal pigment we talk about. The iron is in the Fe plus two state, which is the ferrous state. And one of the things you learned in chemistry is that there are um, different elements that have the ability to be in two different states based on uh, the, the net charge. So this state of, of, of iron is plus two, and this state is plus three. It has one less electron. So we're playing with electrons, and the removal of electrons is called oxidation. The gaining of electrons is called reduction. And it's hard, electrons are not one of those things that, that, that's easy to change. Especially, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to take an electron off than to put one on unless you have something to help you do that there aren't just free electrons floating around out there. And, and usually to have oxidation or reduction, you have some help with an enzyme or with other compounds. So something has to either donate or uh, take up that extra electron. So we see here that deoxymyoglobin, which is purple, uh, can go to metmyoglobin just by the addition, uh, I'm sorry, the removal of one electron with oxidation. We can get myoglobin to reduce and go back to deoxymyoglobin by adding electrons. And in the living tissue, there are compounds that have oxidation reduction potential. I know that's probably not a wonderful word for you. You start seeing to gloss over and you're like, I hate oxidation reduction potential. Oxidation reduction potential are are when there are compounds that are present that can either donate uh, an electron to reduce or take away an electron to oxidize. So living tissue has the ability to do that. We can also go from deoxymyoglobin to oxymyoglobin, not by reduction or oxidation, but by oxygenation or deoxygenation. And so notice here in these arrows, it's either plus oxygen or minus oxygen. When we take vacuum packaged meat, which I showed you was deoxymyoglobin, just open up the package, inside there it's less than 1% oxygen, no oxygen. You open the package and it's exposed to 16% oxygen and look what happens, it turns bright cherry red or it oxygenates and becomes ox oxymyoglobin. We can also get carboxymyoglobin, and that is the addition of CO. We talked about carbon monoxide and the addition of it. Carbon monoxide, uh, if we have CO either in the environment, in the blood, uh, in the muscle, uh, through packaging hopefully, it has a very high preference for binding to the ligand, and it, in the deoxymyoglobin state, uh, the CO will quickly bind to the ligand and form carboxymyoglobin, which is Fe plus two and bright cherry red. And that can, with oxidation, go to metmyoglobin eventually. So when you think about shelf life and you're measuring color shelf life in your proposals, many of you, what you were measuring if you were in vacuum packaging 
product, you were measuring how, how long it took for deoxymyoglobin to go to metmyoglobin. Because this is the end of shelf life. Or if you were doing modified atmosphere packaging, you were looking at how oxymyoglobin oxidized or oxidation to metmyoglobin. Because there you also, oxymyoglobin to metmyoglobin, we have to lose an electron, we have to have oxidation. Uh, to bring it back, we have to have reduction, where we have something that donates an electron. And so you're, you're measuring these different states. Metmyoglobin is when we have meat at the end of its shelf life. Now, the other thing that can happen in this system is that microorganisms have oxidation reduction potential. And so when we get microbial growth and spoilage, whether vacuum packaging or in an aerobic environment, aerobic or anaerobic, uh, we'll eventually get microorganisms that have oxidation reduction potential, and they'll help convert either oxy or deoxymyoglobin to metmyoglobin. So color is an indication of microbial growth, not a perfect indication, but it gives us an indication of when we're at the end of the shelf life. And USDA FSIS is very sensitive to that. We in meat science do not, we're not allowed to add compounds that will help be re reducing compounds. Uh, sulfides, have been used in vegetables to keep them looking good in color. We can we could add them to meat, and we can convert metmyoglobin to deoxy or oxymyoglobin and make it look fresh. But that doesn't change the microbial level on the product, does it? And because color is not is such an indication of fresh freshness. Remember that's why I said consumers think it's fresh. It's a bright cherry red color. And so they know that when it starts to get brown, there's something wrong, it's close to spoilage. So uh, one of the things that, that also affects uh, not only the, what color, what pigment, this is percent deoxymyoglobin, metmyoglobin in the dash line, and red dash is oxymyoglobin. And uh, this is also uh, from, well, this is from Pencils of Meat Science. And uh, it's in Lowry's Meat Science, but it's in your textbook as well. And this is total myoglobin uh, form percentage. This is partial pressure. So that's basically how much is there as a proponent of the whole. So down here at zero, where we have basically no oxygen, uh, a very low amount, right? 0% deoxy or metmyoglobin. We have uh, no oxygen down here. The meat is going to have some, uh, a very little, but a little bit of oxymyoglobin and a little bit of metmyoglobin on the surface. As we ink, so this is vacuum packaged. Look at deoxy, doable. We have deoxys there at the top, isn't it? It's 100% with 0% oxygen. This is vacuum packaged. Uh, partial pressure of oxygen in air is right in here. So let's look at this line. Is there any deoxy in air? No. When we expose meat to air, the deoxymyoglobin disappears between zero and 16, 15%. Notice we start out at zero with lots, with almost all of our pigment and deoxy. But as we decrease the amount of oxygen, or increase the amount of oxygen available up to uh, our, our current environment, all the deoxymyoglobin goes away because on that pigment at first, at between five and 10, percent oxygen, we're going to get a lot of metmyoglobin form. And then that's going to decrease, and as we increase the amount of oxygen, 
oxymyoglobin takes over because oxygen's binding to the ligand. So one of the points of this, other than kind of understanding these, these differences, is that when you look at a piece of meat, it's very seldom 100% in one pigment or one form of the pigment. Uh, you're going to find that even in aerobic uh, packages, you're going to have some met myoglobin. There's probably a little bit of deoxymyoglobin right be below the surface, and then oxymyoglobin. So let's talk about each one of these pigments. First, let's talk about deoxymyoglobin. Um, this is deoxymyoglobin. There's water uh, by that ligand. This is vacuum packaged, very low partial pressure. Almost all the pigment in vacuum packaging is gonna be in the deoxy state. Uh, it's purple in color. It's in the Fe plus state, which is the reduced form. It's very unstable. On that previous chart, a little bit of oxygen in that package, boom, changes. And that's because the water that's here in association with this ligand has greater affinity for oxygen because that's its job to hold oxygen than to water. So as soon as some oxygen is available, it goes right to the ligand. And um, so we see uh, conversion of usually because we don't always have oxidation uh, states, we see oxy deoxymyoglobin go to oxymyoglobin and it can go to metmyoglobin as we said but that's a little bit harder to do right away uh, with it just the change of partial pressure volume. So there's deoxymyoglobin, you need to know that. And this of course is from your textbook uh, and each one of these is from the textbook. Oxymyoglobin looks a little bit better, doesn't it? Bright cherry red. And in this case, this is where we have oxidation. As we increase the partial pressure of oxygen, there it is, uh, associated with that ligand. It's bright red. The iron is still in the reduced form in Fe plus two. Uh, but this is oxygenated form, where you have oxygen on the ligand. And under atmospheric conditions, oxymyoglobin is very stable. But uh, and not easily oxidized to metmyoglobin. Uh, and we get oxymyoglobin formed spontaneously when meat's exposed to air. And how stable that color is depends on the continuing supply of oxygen because there are enzymes involved in oxidative metabolism that will use up oxygen that's present. Why they use more than they need in modified atmosphere packaging, right? Metmyoglobin is the oxidized form. It's the only Fe plus three. So you see that uh, we have taken away an electron from the iron in that heme, uh, and it's brown in color. You can see the brown color here, but it's very stable. It's hard to get metmyoglobin to change. The meat will remain brown in, in color indefinitely, or as long as it's exposed to air. Uh, you can remove oxygen and get and develop reducing conditions and it can be converted back to a desirable color, but we're not allowed legally to add reducing compounds to meat to make it look good. Because uh, remember, metmyoglobin is also an indication of microbial growth and spoilage. So there are some other fun things that can be uh, bound to the ligand. One of the reasons that cyanide is a poison, as well as CO, carbon monoxide, is because CN, cyanide, can bind to the ligand. And actually the ligand has, a prefer, has preferential, uh, preferentially binds cyanide to oxygen. When I was in graduate school, uh, we used to have these frozen bulls, heifers, and steers. And we took them to the, at that time, National Cattlemen's Association meeting, annual meeting in Kansas City in January, where it was about minus 10. And we harvested these animals and then we let them go through rigor standing up and we let the hides on them. They looked like cattle, they were just frozen cattle. 
And we had surfaces cut from them to make points about percent muscling, the effect of brain size, the effect of sex, all these things. Well, the reefer truck that we had used to transport the, our herd from Colorado to Kansas City, the freezing unit uh, broke down. So we're in Kansas City. We're bringing these, these animals. They were on wheels. We used to grab them by the ear and lead them around. You could flip them around, do all kinds of things. And um, we would need to make them look fresh every day. So we painted the meat with cyanide and it became very bright cherry red. Well, we had this other problem. So it's minus 10 outside. That's all we really need to keep these out, these car, these animals frozen, right? But downtown Kansas City has a high homeless population. So we had to hire a guard to watch our frozen animals on the dock of the convention center because we didn't want anybody defacing them and eating meat with cyanide. But it looked good, looked good and fresh. If you were homeless, it would have been a, a very tempting thing. So I want to talk just so this is the same type of reaction, but I notice I put reduction and oxidation. I use this slide because it shows where you gain an electron and where you lose an electron. So in, in meat, we have the ability to, in living tissue, I said we have the ability for metmyoglobin to convert back to oxymyoglobin or reduce myoglobin depending on the oxygen level within the muscle. In meat, we're not allowed to add uh, the compounds that are going to uh, allow us to convert Fe plus three to Fe plus two. What is that? And uh, in the mitochondria, we know that um, it's going to use oxygen and it's going to use NAD plus and NADH. That's going to be the carrier for the hydrogen back and forth, right? And uh, the cytochrome chain is down here. And the one thing we haven't talked about that much with the cytochrome chain, not only do we know it needs oxygen, but look what's a byproduct of cytochrome chain, an electron. That electron can then be used to help with, with um, with oxidation, make sure, to convert from Fe plus two to Fe plus, I mean Fe plus three to Fe plus two. I'm gonna get confused here, sorry. There's also an enzyme out in the sarcoplasm where, met, where myoglobin is called metmyoglobin reducing activity. And what it does is it helps to add electrons back on to metmyoglobin to get it back to oxymyoglobin state. And the, some of those electrons are going to come from the cytochrome chain. Metmyoglobin reducing activity is still somewhat functional in muscle or, or in meat after it's converted from muscle to meat. And this is early post-mortem, but this enzyme's gonna wear out. Just like calpanes and calpostatins wear out, this enzyme is going to wear out. And so if you look at late post-mortem, what you're going to do is you have less electrons being produced by the mitochondria because it's been shut off, and you've also worn out the metmyoglobin reducing activity. So uh, when we look at shelf life of meat, part of what's going on is this interrelationship between the mitochondria production of electrons, how much oxygen is present, and how much metmyoglobin reducing activity, uh, how well it can, it can perform. So um, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is on the surface of meat, we have seen that we have a predominant uh, form of myoglobin, deoxy oxy met, that affects the color. But have you ever thought about this? This is a steak, and when you cut into a steak, when it's raw, you actually see three layers of color. There's oxymyoglobin, and this is supposed to show steak and retail display for zero hour. 
There's oxymyoglobin. Right underneath it, right there, is metmyoglobin. Because there's all this oxygen that's there, right? And it is going to the metmyoglobin form. And then you have in the middle the purple. And the, after you cut it, that purple will convert back to oxy. You will also many times see this metmyoglobin. But you see that little brown line. Cut your steak open tonight before you cook it and see if you can see it. What happens with storage is that, notice that here's the line for metmyoglobin. And uh, with more time, there develops more metmyoglobin and it starts to surface. We see storage, and some of you I ask you to do percent discoloration, because a steak doesn't just turn brown uh, when it's starting to form metmyoglobin, oxymyoglobin, and metmyoglobin. You'll see little spots, and that's the metmyoglobin coming to the surface. This is the view from the top. Here's the zero day, and look here. Here's the metmyoglobin starting to show. Uh, through there at, at three days. And there's been a lot of work on this and, and, and what's really going on, but eventually this will take over. What factors enhance or stabilize color? Uh, vitamin E is an antioxidant and it will actually bind to, uh, in some of those pictures you saw, histine. I think it's histine 56. And vitamin E will bind to that and will stabilize what's bound to that ligand. It'll help to close down that channel. Other antioxidants can also do that where it will bind to some uh, portion of myoglobin and help to stabilize it. If you increase pH, you will uh, enhance or stabilize color but it'll also make color darker because of pH's effect on water holding capacity. If you have very high oxygen pressure, like in modified atmosphere packaging, it's 80% oxygen, very high oxygen pressure, you'll be able to stabilize color. And if we could add reducing agents, we could keep it in the oxy um, myoglobin form and keep it from going to MET because we could keep it from going from Fe plus two to Fe plus three. But again, not legal. It's always been something like rats, right? Uh, what things result in color deterioration? What things are going to really induce oxy or deoxymyoglobin going to metmyoglobin? Light. Light is, right, waves. And uh, what will happen is there's energy in those light waves. So over at the Retail Meat Center, over at Rosenthal, they have frozen product, but they have a real, they have a problem if they don't rotate their meat uh, from top to bottom and flip it, because the top, if it's set there underneath the lights all the time, will turn brown. And it isn't spoiled, it's just met myoglobin form by light. And you flip it over and it's bright cherry red, oxymyoglobin. So the longer it's exposed to light, the greater chance you have for the light energy to bounce off an electron. Time, just time. Uh, Matt myoglobin reducing activity is gonna wear out with time. Uh, you have a greater opportunity to lose an electron with time, and you most likely are gonna lose some of the oxygen bound to the ligand. As you change temperature, one of the reasons that uh, a lot of times I get people sending me pictures my friend Liz uh, Wonderlich works for US Meat Export Federation. She does a lot of work in the Caribbean. And she's like, she'll send me a picture and say, I need help, what do you think this is? And it's this colored meat, almost always. And I'm like, okay, who left it out on the dock in the middle of Nassau, Bahamas, in the middle of summer? Because it always is a temperature issue. Because if you have higher temperature, you have more energy, you have a great, you change from oxy or deoxy to met more rapidly. If you expose it to low levels of oxygen, not zero and not 16, but in between, did you notice what happened? Met myoglobin went up between 10 and 5 and 10. And that's because there's just not enough pressure there 
and it's going to convert to the myoglobin C. If you have more myoglobin, so those muscles with more myoglobin, they develop met myoglobin more rapidly just because they have more myoglobin to convert. And it, you know, it's kind of like small population versus a big population. And uh, you're going to have, even if you, you have, you have a greater chance of more of those converting. And if you have oxidizing agents present, we're not allowed to add oxidizing agents as well as reducing agents, but that can happen. One of the biggest oxidizing agents that we have are microorganisms, to be honest with you. So we have, we've talked about PFD and DFD before, and we know that those are related to pH. Those don't really change the myoglobin. In PFC, if we have very rapid development of rigor, and we get a high temperature, a really big temperature spike, we can have some heat denaturation of myoglobin that's going to cause the color to be a little bit lighter. But that's in pretty big, uh, you know, in real extreme situations. We know that the PSC and DFD issue is related to light reflectance, right? And that the color absorbance or color reflection isn't just based on myoglobin, but free water. And I just wanted to bring that in here so that you didn't confuse those. Cooked meat color. How does cooked meat color develop? Cooked meat color is simple. Myoglobin is red. As it heat denatures, it turns gray. What do we see when we cook meat? It goes from a red state to a brown state. Medium rare is gray on the outside and pink in the middle, sometimes red. And so it is just uh, uh, the progressive loss of redness with increasing temperature from progressive denaturation of the pigment. And this is an example, you can see this. Uh, the state color guide, very rare, rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, very well. Uh, the reason this looks like this, same amount of myoglobin, but this has been more heat denatured, it's been cooked longer and cooked to higher temperature. Other factors that affect myoglobin heat denaturation. pH. Uh, if you increase pH by using phosphates, it protects myoglobin so that it doesn't heat denature at the same rate. So phosphates are a very good addition to further processed products and if you cook, if you have a, uh, we have an enhanced, we talked about this a little bit, enhanced and non-enhanced, and you cook them both to 145, the enhanced will look really rare, and the non-enhanced will look uh, about uh, anywhere from about medium rare. Uh, sodium, we talked about sodium phosphate, the amount of myoglobin, if you have more myoglobin, it takes more heat to denature all of it. So a t if you take a top round steak and a top loin steak and you have them the same thickness and they're cooked at the, on the same grill at the same temperature to the same internal temperature, the top round steak will look like it is more rare because it has more myoglobin to denature. And when you use dry heat, uh, you will um, see uh, more browning on the exterior surface and you will see the uh, myoglobin the nature at a more rapid rate. With wet heat, because we don't get browning and get Maillard reaction, uh, a lot of times we'll see uh, the color linger a little bit longer. Okay, and then when you take Dr. Uh, Osborne's class, you'll talk about nitrosahemochrome and dinitrosahemochrome, where you have nitrite uh, 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 associated with the ligand. I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, I'm going to end this by talking about how we measure color. We've already talked about this. I've given you the color guidelines, and they have scales for subjective evaluation. We know that from an objective standpoint, we talked about, and I showed you and brought the Minolta in, where we, we measure A star, L star, A star, B star color space values. We can measure hue, chroma. Uh, we can measure our red, blue, and green. Uh, we can do X, Y, Z coordinates. We can do L, A, B color space values, which are a little bit different than L star, A star, B star. If you want to know the difference in all those, read your AMSA guidelines. 
The subjective evaluation is where we use color cards and you know we, uh oh, sorry, went the wrong way. I wanted to go this way. This would be an example of a color card for degree of doneness. We, I showed you the color cards for beef, most of you. And you use this so that you always have a reference to go back to. You could use paint chips and develop differences in colors and assign them a score. So those are ways to measure color. So I hope that you've gotten a good feel for the color pigments in meat and factors that affect their chemical state and how to measure color and then factors that affect color in meat. Thank you very much.